Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you very much for coming to this uh, important event about the next phase of the Chelsea Manning defense and where we stand with the whistleblower issues these days, which are really changing a lot constantly. My name is Kevin Zies. I am on the steering committee of the Chelsea Manning Support Network. I've been involved in it for more than four years. I got involved very early in the process because I thought that the documents that were released to WikiLeaks by Chelsea were historically important and politically important. And uh, I hope that in the future we'll see actually more analysis of the documents and uh, less, less analysis of uh, the personalities involved. Uh, they really are important documents. I expect down the road some smart PhD students can do their thesis on the Snowden and Manning documents and do an amazing book that will give us great insight into the thinking of the key people in the U.S. government down to the low-level folks in the, involved in the war in the State Department. So I think they're really an incredible resource that we have not yet fully uh, gotten to understand. Uh, in addition to uh, serving the steering committee, I also work with Popular Resistance, which is an organization that's covered the Manning trial consistently. We try to bring together multiple movements uh, working for transformative change, and part of that change is about our security state. I also serve as the Attorney General for the Green Shadow Cabinet, so I'm a lawyer. I am the lawyer on the steering committee of the Manning Support Network, the only one. Um, anyway, um, so you know, after I got into Manning for those reasons, after I got into Chelsea's case for the reasons of the importance of the, of the materials, the cha case really changed, and it became about uh, the, the system that was used to prosecute her and the uh, torture, solitary confinement they wanted for more than a year became a, a big highlight. But then when we got into the trial, we started to see all sorts of, really, those of you who were there uh, re recall some of the bizarre kind of antics of the prosecutors not giving discovery materials to the last minute and changing the nature of the charges uh, at, after the trial was already complete, just really strange stuff that most kangaroo courts wouldn't do and, and keep a straight face. But uh, Judge Lynn was able to go through that and find Manning guilty and unfortunately gave her a very long sentence. So I think this appeal is really important for a lot of reasons, and I'm looking forward to hearing the lawyers for, for Chelsea talking about some of the issues. But I think it has a real key point of the uh, appeals is it can really help to define what a press freedom is going to be like in this century. You know, one of the charges that Chelsea was convicted of was the Espionage Act, a very rarely used act. It's an act that uh, Barack Obama's administration has used more than every other president combined. And it's um, an important uh, issue in this case because Chelsea was found guilty of espionage but had no intent to commit espionage. The judge said no intent was needed. Uh, when I went to criminal law uh, 101, that was like one of the key elements of every crime was the criminal intent. You have to intend to commit a crime. So rather bizarrely, this very important crime, uh, espionage, which has very serious repercussions for people, uh, you don't have to evidently prove criminal intent. So I, I suspect that's going to be an issue that goes up the courts, up to the Supreme Court, and get resolved there. And that will be very critical for all of our press freedoms because so much, any, any leaked document has the potential of being called espionage. Uh, any uh, focus on uh, weaknesses in the U.S. military could be, fo could be described as espionage, whether you intend to be espionage or not. And so that could really have a big impact on what we get to know about what our security state is doing. But there's lots of other issues that will come up as well. Uh, you know, the mistreatment, the speedy trial, the, the, the various uh, actions of the prosecutors. I mean, it's a really interesting appeal and a very important appeal on lots of fronts. We have a really great um, group of people speaking tonight. Uh, we're going to start, though, with, um, with uh, Emma Cape, who is, Emma Cope, who has been uh, a very key player in the organization. And uh, she is going to uh, give us an update on what the support network's been doing to support Manning. She's been um, kind of the, the lead organizer uh, for the support network since 2011. And, and she's been working with communities for the last 10 years on uh, all sorts of issues. And since joining the support network, she's worked with volunteers around the world to organize hundreds of actions and events demonstrating support for Chelsea and her co cause of government transparency. She's now the support network's direct liaison to Chelsea Manning, so she will have a lot to say about uh, that if you have questions about that. Uh, and she'll give an update about the campaign and what we're doing. 
And uh, this is really a grassroots campaign, and I appreciate the turnout tonight. We didn't even mention the free food, and you all showed up. So we really appreciate that. God, if we had mentioned the free food, there'd be twice as many people here. <laughs> Emma Cave, give her a hand. Oh. So thank you all very much for being here tonight. I helped organize this event along with some students at the Georgetown Law Center who are active with the National Lawyers Guild and the ACLU here. Um, so I'd like to thank them as well for helping us bring this together. And for me, there were two big reasons I wanted to organize this event. One was because of course, Chelsea Manning's appeals are coming up, and we've hired a new legal team. And it's, it's a very big transition, but also a very exciting time for our organization. But the second reason would be because I think we've seen, um, with the events in the news recently, with what's going on with Edward Snowden, um, what's gone on with the, the struggle to declassify the CIA report, um, that this issue on on enhanced interrogation, that this issue of um, freedom of information and government transparency is something that the public is becoming increasingly aware of. And there's also a real need to have more serious discussions in our country about how we move forward and enhance our democracy instead of rolling back those freedoms. Um, so that's why I invited. Um, we have some Great speakers tonight, um, Mike German, who is an FBI whistleblower, and Thomas Drake, um, who had worked with the NSA. And Kevin Zeist will tell you more about them. Um, but first, I would like to <coughs> just give a brief overview of what the Chelsea Manning Support Network is up to. Um, so first, I would like to remind people of the things that we've already accomplished. I know that for those who attended the trial in the D.C. area, um, the outcome was disappointing, although it was also a far shorter sentence than what the prosecution had called for. Um, but so what, what we did is over the last four years, we managed to raise enough money to maintain a civilian legal defense for Chelsea Manning um, so that she wouldn't be dependent on the military. <laughs> for her defense, um, and we funded public education events around the world. And what that means for us is that we had hundreds of communities organizing actions to protest her 1,000th day in confinement and to protest the trial. We had over 1,000 people come out to um, Fort Meade for the trial, which was the largest number they've ever had at that base. Um, we also, I think, played a real role in helping shift public opinion. There were a number of organizations that had not um, made a decision about Chelsea's actions and whether um, they represented the kind of government transparency we need. After the trial, we had the New York Times, the ACLU, Amnesty International, and Human Rights Watch all condemn that decision. Um, and they've stayed engaged with the, with the case as we're moving forward. Um, now, of course, we have Nancy Hollander and Vincent Ward, who have been assigned as the um, appeals team. And so far, um, they're going to speak more to this, but we expect that the appeals process is going to touch on some larger issues, like freedom of information, government secrecy, and illegal pretrial punishment. So one of our big jobs moving forward is continuing to raise the funds um, to make sure that we're able to support their legal defense um, so that they can do the best job they can. Um, <coughs> let's see. All right, so also, in addition to that, I'd like to mention that attorney David Coombs, who represented Chelsea during the trial, has stayed involved um, he just submitted a clemency packet to the convening authority, General Buchanan. Over 3,000 people contributed letters to that clemency packet. We're currently waiting to hear back on Major General Buchanan's decision. David Coombs has also agreed to help Chelsea 
obtain uh, access to treatment for her gender dysphoria while she's at Fort Leavenworth Prison. That includes hormone therapy, access to counseling, and other matters. So another thing the support network is doing is raising money so that we can continue to support David Coombs' work in that direction. Another thing we're doing um, at this point in the post-trial phase is personal support for Chelsea. As Kevin mentioned, I'm now the direct liaison, so I talk with her over the phone a couple times a week. Um, I'm, a I'm acting now <coughs> both as a liaison to help her deliver public statements and also to communicate with the media. We've also been playing a role helping her stay in touch with friends and family. Her, visitor, her visitations um, at Fort Leavenworth are still under a number of restrictions. She had a friend from the UK who wanted to come visit her recently and was told that it would take three weeks for them to do a background check. So he asked to visit in another couple of months. So we're continuing to interface with the facility um, to try to enhance her quality of life. We've sponsored her newspaper subscriptions to the New York Times and the Washington Post. <laughs> and finally, Chelsea is planning on enrolling in college in the fall. Um, so even though she's in prison, she's, she's trying to move forward on her personal life goals. And we will be helping to set up independent studies <coughs> when she gets to the BA level so that she can specialize in pre-law and political science. So for those of you who are here, either because you've volunteered with the support network in the past or because you're interested in becoming involved in our work in the future, there are a few things um, you can do at this point. We have a new petition um, which is going to the White House calling on them to act on, their, on the request that Chelsea has filed for an official presidential pardon. The White House has stated that they are not going to respond to this request until after the appeals process. And we think this is outrageous because this appeals process is likely to take years. Um, so really what that response is is a stalling process. And David Coombs has said as much. So we want people to sign our petition, but also you write and call the White House, asking them to make a decision based on her request. You can also write to Chelsea directly. She does receive mail, and she enjoys receiving it. Our website, where you can find her mailing address, is chelseamanning.org. And last, I've said it before, but I'll say it again. Uh, one of her big goals moving forward is trying to do fundraising for the appeals process and for our on other ongoing support work. So I know many of you have donated before. Uh, I'm going to ask that you consider donating again. Um, but we also are looking for people who would be interested in helping organize fundraising events in their local community and organizing others in that way. So you can come talk to me after the event if you're interested in that. For those who are watching this on live stream, you can go to chelseamanning.org for more information and chelseamanning.org slash donate to donate to her legal appeals. And for those in the DC area, there's one additional announcement I don't want to forget, and that's that we have an organizer um, Sergey Kostin, who's interested in organizing an event here in May and is looking for help with that. So you can come talk to him if you want more details. All right, I think that's everything. Thank you. <laughs> Emma Cope will be around uh, for the whole session and at the question and answer period. If you have questions, you can ask uh, questions of her as well as the panel. Um, I, I do want to emphasize that we really do need to keep supporting Chelsea. This is, a, this is Chelsea against the, the most powerful government in the world uh, with unlimited resources and a great deal of venomous dislike of her. 
And uh, it's been amazing the support that has come from the grassroots. It's been really fantastic. Uh, and it's really been a grassroots, primarily grassroots funded effort. There have been some large donors. I'll mention just a couple that I've worked with. Eugene Dure Jarecki, who's a great filmmaker, documentary filmmaker, has come up with uh, support at critical moments that then was, has been matched by the grassroots. And his mother as well, uh, Gloria Jarecki, has done the same at critical moments when we were really in a hole and running out of resources, she came through at key times, and then that was matched by the grassroots. And really, uh, but really, the grassroots has been the key. And we really want to thank people for stepping up. And this is a multi-year process ahead of us. So still, keep keep in mind and keep involved with Sergey Sergey locally because uh, we need to keep the attention on on Chelsea's case. Our first uh, speaker uh, has been briefly described by Emma. Mike German uh, was a whistleblower for the FBI. I guess for the FBI or against the FBI? That's a <laughs> uh, he blew the whistle in Congress about deficiencies in the FBI's counterterrorism operations program. He was a 16-year veteran with the uh, FBI, serving as a special agent in domestic terrorism and also covert operations. He left in 2004 uh, to tell Congress about some of the problems and uh, stayed involved in uh, issues since then. He began uh, lecturing on counterintelligence issues uh, and joined the ACLU in Washington, D.C. Uh, he currently serves in the uh, Liberty and National Security Program for the Brennan Center uh, for Justice. This, by the way, is the microphone for the live stream, so we're going to pass this around as we talk. Mike German, please welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate uh, being invited to come and speak. Um, and, and in thinking about how I could be most helpful, um, one of the areas that I think I I'm well suited to push back against is this idea you hear about critics of, of government whistleblowers, particularly in the intelligence community, that they had avenues to pursue uh, where they could have reported safely and not been retaliated against, and, and that's simply not true. Uh, that's exactly what I attempted to do as an FBI agent. I was actually working undercover at the time and uh, didn't, you know, much less want any public awareness of what was going on, wanted to be completely anonymous. Um, but unfortunately, even reporting wrongdoing internally within a law enforcement agency, ironically enough, uh, is, is regarded as such a, uh, a flaw that, uh, that they would go after you uh, even when there is no public disclosure. So the idea that somebody could, could make a public disclosure, I think, is, is uh, completely wrong. And what I think we're seeing now, this phenomenon of mass releases by whistleblowers, is because of the pressure being put on internally. In other words, when, when uh, the mechanisms that were established to provide controls on the intelligence community no longer work uh, for those in insiders who have knowledge of programs that uh, they believe are illegal, there aren't many places to go. And uh, as a whistleblower advocate uh, at the ACLU and, and now at the Brennan Center, I often get contacted by people who are considering blowing the whistle. And the first thing I say to them is, are you willing to lose your job? And I often get an astonished response that, well, no, I'm doing the right thing here. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I know, <laughs> but are you willing to lose your job? And uh, I say, you know, doesn't matter that you're doing the right thing, doesn't matter that you're telling the truth, doesn't matter that you've never been in trouble before. Uh, I've seen far too many whistleblowers, uh, sometimes over the course of years, you know, one thing after another, retaliatory investigation after another, until they finally uh, either pressure them out, uh, much like they did with me. I was just unwilling to put up with that nonsense and uh, voluntarily resigned, or they will find a way to fire you. So. Um, I think what is most frustrating for a whistleblower is that you always expect that this is going to land on somebody's desk who's going to do the right thing. <laughs> and, uh, and maybe Tom can, can talk about this as well. Um, and they're often astonished to find out that the people with responsibility for doing intelligence oversight, particularly the intelligence committees, very rarely want to speak to a whistleblower. And often when they do, uh, they give them very short shrift and aren't really interested in pursuing any reform measures based on what they're re reporting about. 
Um, <clears throat> in my case, I was very lucky. Uh, the, the one exception to this rule uh, is Senator Grassley from Iowa, who's, who's very good with whistleblowers, and, and certainly if anybody knows a whistleblower out there uh, in, in the government, particularly in the intelligence community or the FBI, uh, his office is probably the first place to go. Um, and, and he can be fairly aggressive in pursuing the truth, um, but it's very hard for somebody who, who is working to expose these matters to actually create reforms. Uh, so I think what we're seeing now with these mass releases is the fact that there aren't avenues to report, and, and that's both because the, the oversight mechanisms are broken and because there is no way to get the information to the public, and it, re it really requires the public response. I mean, I testified uh, against extending the uh, Patriot Act in 2009 and again in 2011, and uh, had a number of members of Congress wag their finger at me and say, you can't prove there's any abuse. <laughs> uh, of course, now it's a very different tune because finally we can prove extensive abuse of this authority and even Representative Sensenbrenner, who claims authorship of the Patriot Act, says that this was not what Congress intended uh, when they passed the, the law. So clearly there is something wrong with, with the structure of intelligence oversight, and until we reform that, we can expect these sorts of, of behaviors, which is why we see the government reacting so strongly against what are the only to avenues of public awareness of intelligence programs, and that's going after whistleblowers and going after journalists. And this administration particularly has been especially aggressive in doing both. Um, when uh, Congress in 2012 uh, uh, reformed the Whistleblower Protection Enhancement Act, uh, they left out whistleblowers from the intelligence communities and the FBI. Uh, the President issued a presidential directive, uh, presidential policy directive number 19, uh, which is intended to establish an internal uh, mechanism for intelligence agencies except the FBI. Uh, the, uh, the FBI already has a, a program internally, and it was very unclear whether what they were creating was actually going to be worse <laughs> than what the FBI has, which tells you how effective that would be. Um, but at the same time, uh, they were responding to uh, both Chelsea Manning's leaks, and this was prior to the Ed Snowden leaks, uh, and started an insider threat program where they were specifically targeting dissenters and whistleblowers within the intelligence community for extra scrutiny even before they made their whistleblower disclosures. Uh, so, you know, while, while on the one hand the presidential directive is a positive half step forward. Uh, unfortunately, they're working against it uh, even within the agencies as they move forward. Um, so I think it's really incumbent that we take this opportunity now that we have seen the intelligence oversight mechanisms become open to reform, uh, that we also start talking seriously about making sure that whistleblower protections for the intelligence community are strong enough uh, to provide mechanisms for people to report that information. because. Without them, uh, we're not going to get the information we need as public citizens to make sure that we maintain democra democratic controls over the intelligence agencies. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, some serious problems. Um, our next speaker, Thomas Drake, uh, told us things about the NSA before Ed Snowden leaked the documents that proved that he was telling us the truth. A lot of people didn't believe what he was saying at the time, but Ed Snowden's documents showed that uh, this whistleblower was telling us the truth, and he blew the whistle on illegal wiretapping and fraud at the NSA. Uh, he's a former senior executive of the NSA, a decorated U.S. Air Force and Navy veteran, and of course he's a whistleblower. In 2010, the government alleged that Drake mishandled documents, I'll put mishandled in quotes, uh, leading him to become one of the few people charged under the Espionage Act. Uh, shortly after his story was told in 60 Minutes, all 10 original charges against him were dropped and on June 9th, on, on June 9th 2011. Uh, Drake rejected several plea agreements uh, and kept on fighting. He said um, he refused to plea bargain with the truth. 
Uh, he eventually pled to one misdemeanor count of exceeding authorized use of a computer and received one year probation. This was an amazing victory uh, since he was originally facing up to 35 years in jail. Uh, he's a 2011 recipient of the Rittenhauer Prize for Truth Telling and co-recipient of the Sam Adams Association Associates for Integrity and Intelligence Award. Uh, please welcome Thomas Drake. Wow. I'm here standing as a fellow whistleblower and truth teller with Chelsea Manning. Unfortunately, we are increasingly an endangered species of human being. I'm also here to simply support Chelsea and serve as a witness for history and her actions holding up the mirror to the dark side of the United States. See, I used to serve in the military at the same rank as Chelsea when I was in the United States Air Force. And although I eventually became an officer in the Navy and served as a senior executive at the NSA, I can directly identify with Chelsea and exactly what she went through and what she discovered and the fateful choices she made to reveal the truth. On my lapel is a cue. I've been wearing this ever since uh, the Ridden Hour Truth Telling Prize was awarded to me in April of 2011. That Q stands for question everything, but especially authority. You see, we stand at the crossroads of a metastasizing empire. It's the American empire. And what we are witnessing now, and as I witness the history, is the United States' national security regime pursuing an unrelenting and absolutely ruthless war on truth tellers, whistleblowers, journalism, reporting. It's really about a war for the control of information. And I must say this in the starkest possible language yet again, where we're here to fundamentally stand up for who Chelsea is and what she did for us. The government is engaged in a direct assault on the First Amendment upon our inalienable and our, the heart and core of our sovereign rights as citizens. And it is, I will say it is, and given what Chelsea has already gone through and finds herself incarcerated in a military prison, and what I myself faced over many, many years, we are eyewitnesses to the history that is unfolding before us. A clear and compelling danger to democracy and liberty. You see, it is now criminal to expose war crimes. It is criminal to disclose government wrongdoing. It is criminal to reveal violations of the law. It is criminal to reveal the subversion of the Constitution. It is criminal to expose how for so many years, we have simply set aside the rule of law and all kinds of international conventions, including the Geneva Convention. You see, both Chelsea and myself took an oath. I've taken that oath four times in my government career. That oath is not an oath to secrecy. 
That oath is not an oath to hiding the truth. That oath is not to the president. That oath is not to the military. That oath is to no person. That oath is not an oath to break the law. The oath is not an oath to violate the sovereign rights of citizens, no matter where they are. That oath is not to look aside when you see torture and wrongdoing. That oath is to the idea of how to govern ourselves. And it was a grand experiment launched over 225 years ago. That oath is an oath to support and defend the Constitution. An idea, just an idea. And that oath is to support and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. I said the Q stands for question everything, especially authority. Both Chelsea and me, when we were in the military, fell under what was called the Uniform Accord of Military Justice. And there's a particular article I just want to bring to light, and that's Article 92. The reason I'm bringing Article 92 to light is precisely what Chelsea was confronted by, as well as me, in discovering orders and activity and conduct on the part of the military and our government that violated our oath. You see, Article 92 doesn't require you to follow any order, only lawful orders. And you actually have an obligation, if you believe that the order is unlawful, to question, to question the order. What happens when you discover, to your horror, as I did, as Chelsea did, that what the government is doing is engaging in a whole set of orders and activities and conduct that violate the fundamental nature of who we are and what we're supposed to represent, and what was established over 225 years ago for all of its faults and foibles. It is, it still is the rule of law. It takes primacy over everything else. But see, there's one more thing I must say about Article 92. Why would you question, why would you question an order? Well, if the order is unlawful, you are under no obligation to obey it. Under no obligation to obey an unlawful order. Why is that? It wasn't that long ago that there was a war called World War II. And at the end of that war, we put German high command military officers on trial. And what came out of that, the Nuremberg trials, were the Nuremberg principles. And the excuse, the justification that was presented as a defense during the Nuremberg trials, and I've spoken, although unfortunately they've passed away, where my father is retired, he was one of the attorneys at the Nuremberg trials. Went in great detail about how far the German high, the German high Command military had gone in arguing as their defense, I was just following orders. So authority trumps everything else? No, it doesn't. And that that defense did not hold. Just following orders was not an excuse for committing crimes against humanity. We're also eyewitness to what I believe, and Chelsea was riding this wave, the high water mark of the American empire. See, all empires end up in the dustbin of history. There is no immunity granted by history to the United States. Remember the collateral murder video? 
I just want to remind you, it opened up with a quote from George Orwell. And remember what Orwell said, truth is the first casualty of war. Political language is designed to make lies sound truthful and murder respectable and to give the appearance of solidity to pure wind. Both Chelsea and myself and other f fellow truth tellers and whistleblowers have spoken truth to or of power. And yet the sins of the empire end up getting dumped on you. You become the scapegoat in which the empire takes no responsibility for its actions except it holds respons responsible those who would dare hold their actions responsible. The first president of the United States, George Washington, said some very interesting things in his farewell address. After having served two terms, I'm extracting what I believe is an extraordinarily relevant passage from an incredibly eloquent address. I know of no one today who speaks in this manner, let alone writes. We must, we quote, must derive from union an exemption from those broils and wars between themselves, which so frequently afflict neighboring countries not tied together by the same governments, which their own rival ships alone would be sufficient to produce, but which opposite foreign alliances, attachments, and intrigues would stimulate and embitter. Hence, likewise, they will avoid the necessity of those overgrown military establishments, which, under any form of government, are inauspicious to liberty and which are to be regarded as particularly hostile, I repeat, highlight, emphasize, and bold, particularly hostile to Republican liberty. In this sense, it is that your union ought to be considered as a main prop of your liberty, and that the love of one ought to endear you to the preservation of the other. I know, like Chelsea, I would not break faith or allegiance to the oath that I had taken. And as happened to her, so it did with me. I was charged with espionage. The only difference between her and me is she was also charged, and fortunately I did not stand, for aiding the enemy. But the prosecution in my own case said that what I did endangered the lives of American soldiers, that I would have the blood of American soldiers on my hands, and that what I did was worse than being a spy, because at least spies give their secrets to those in other spies in secret or other agents of foreign powers. But what you did was have it disclosed and spread all across the papers, which means everybody gets to see it, including the spies. If there was anybody that Chelsea and I spied on or for or on behalf of, it was American citizens period. So I'm just going to right now just say a few things just to remind us, remind us why Chelsea is currently in a military prison for simply the following. What would you say when you see war crime evidence directly involving your own country, like the collateral murder video of innocent civilians and reporters? What would you say when you see activists detained in Iraq and then tortured with the tacit support of the United States? What does it say 
when you bring your concerns to your chain of command, parenthetically, just like I did, and they tell you not to bother or simply censor and suppress all material evidence. Thousands, in my case, thousands of pages of documents given to multiple government investigators, including two 9-11 congressional investigations and a Department of Defense Office of Inspector General audit and investigation. What does it say when you see evidence later labeled as the Iraqi and Afghanistan war logs detailing and document, documenting all manner of atrocities, indiscriminate killings of civilians, use of torture and additional conduct by the U.S. that raise serious questions about our strategy and intent in both countries. What does it say when you see State Department cables detailing American culpability in suppressing the minimum wage legislation in Haiti and the corruption of authoritarian regimes as well as the U.S. support of those same regimes in the Middle East, in North Africa, plus much more. In fact, there is far more in those logs, in those cables, cables that I myself, in terms of just that whole mechanism, used to routinely read. There's far more in those logs than have actually been revealed in terms of public knowledge, although it's been revealed publicly. What does it say when you see evidence that strips the spin and the lies about U.S. military and foreign policy, pushed by both, I realize I will upset some in the political spectrum, both neoliberal and neoconservative political elites alike, revealing in stark detail the dark underbelly of just those policies. What does it say when you're apparently ordered to turn over innocent Iraqi academics to the police because they publish information about government corruption. When exposed to these truths, just like the truths that I was exposed to, Chelsea placed her conscience above her career despite the extraordinary risks Remember what she said. I want people to see the truth regardless of who they are because without information, you cannot make informed decisions as a public. That is the heart, the center, the vibrating core of the First Amendment. Providing and disclosing information published by WikiLeaks in the public interest not just in the United States, but around the world. And because she made an historically fateful choice to go to the press and share what she had discovered with WikiLeaks, it became a criminal act, a criminal act. So for her convictions, for her conviction, convictions, she was convicted because of the truth. You see, Chelsea exposed the dark shadows of our national security regime, our foreign policy follies, and a government increasingly opting out of liberty and freedom. I will say it here and I will keep saying it as long as I have a voice to say it for the rest of my life. Those who would condemn and vilify Chelsea only serve to promote and preserve the projection of secret unbridled power while personally pathologizing the person of Chelsea through misplaced fears and attack the messenger and completely ignore and displace the message. Her, her acts of civil disobedience are simply given by the courage of her own character and the conviction of her own conscience 
This strikes at the very core of who we are. Our national security, our public and foreign policy, the future stakes involving openness and transparency, and I have to say it again, as well as this unprecedented campaign by this administration in particular to snuff out and silence truth tellers and whistleblowers and a premeditated and deliberate assault on the First Amendment. Chelsea put her future on the line in exposing the dark truths she saw and is those truths she revealed that were really put on trial except the person who ended up convicted was the person who brought the message. What will the verdict of history bring? I do believe, and I'm channeling Martin Luther King Jr., that the long arc of history does bend toward justice and that history will see Chelsea as an extraordinarily courageous person who stood up to empire and the elite and spoke direct truth to power. Never shy away in looking into the mirror of Chelsea Manning's message. It is now time, it is still time, and it will always be time to stand up with Chelsea Manning because we are Chelsea Manning. Thank you, Tom. We certainly, we, we'd certainly be a lot better country if more people took the oath to the Constitution and Article 92 of the UCMJ more seriously. Uh, we wouldn't be committing many of the crimes that we commit as an uh, empire in distress. Um, we're now going to turn to the uh, two lawyers. Our next will be a Skype um, uh, uh, sp speech from Nancy Hollander. Let me say that um, those of us who attended the trial of Chelsea Manning know what great representation she had in David Coombs. He did a great job. <laughs> and we're really proud of the work he did. And we're glad to stand behind him in the courtroom and give him as much support as we could. We really appreciate that. But we're very lucky now in the appellate stage that Chelsea has picked uh, two really excellent lawyers, uh, Nancy Hollander and Vincent Ward. Uh, when I heard Nancy Hollander was uh, chosen uh, to represent uh, Chelsea, I was actually pretty happy. I've, I've known Nancy Hollander for more than 30 years. Uh, from my earlier work as a criminal defense lawyer, I used to organize criminal defense seminars for the National Organization for Reform Marijuana Laws. Uh, when that was kind of a taboo topic. Now, of course, people support legalization, but 30 years does that. Uh, uh, but Nancy, at that point, was a, a rising uh, star in the criminal defense field, and she uh, spoke at the seminars they organized almost every time, and it was very popular as a speaker. She has done great work throughout the years. Uh, she went on to become the uh, president of the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. Uh, highly respected around the country uh, for a great deal of her work. She's handled really complicated cases involving uh, national security and civil forfeiture and criminal forfeiture. Uh, and she's even appeared before the U.S. Supreme Court in a religious freedom case. So uh, I think it's really great that Chelsea has Nancy as one of his counsel, her counsel. And uh, she's also worth noting the National Law Journal in 2001 uh, designated Nancy as one of the top 50 women litigators in the country. So it's great to really have Nancy on Chelsea's uh, team. So is Nancy available? Oh, I was trying to give you time. <laughs> <laughs> I think we should move her. Let's see if we can get it to work. Hello. Uh, yes, just give me a second here. Now I can see you. You can see me, I think. Thank you. Um, thank you all. First, let me say uh, that I, I'm really honored and humbled 
that Chelsea has chosen us to be her counsel. Um, we, um, there are many fine lawyers in this country, and but we are, we're up to the task, we're excited about the task, and we appreciate uh, that uh, Chelsea wrote the letter to me, asked me to be her lawyer. I asked my partner, Vince, to join me, and he'll explain more about why. Vince has a lot of experience in the military in addition to national security work, and we've worked together on an, um, so I'm really glad of that. I'm sorry I can't be, uh, I think my brain works, my body kind of failed me this week, and my doctor didn't allow me to travel, but that's a temporary matter, and I'll be back um, moving at my usual pretty fast pace pretty soon. Vince will pick up where I leave off. I'm not gonna speak too long. It's hard to watch a face that's not there, and it's hard for me because I can't see you. But uh, I do want to tell you, we're just at the beginnings of this case. We have a huge record to read. We have um, a lot of work to do. We've already started, however, and we will be working actively, of course, with Chelsea's detailed military counsel, who I hope is there today and who I look forward to meeting. And of course, we will be working actively with Chelsea. Uh, Chelsea is going to take a very active role in this appeal. Vince and I plan to know every place there is to eat in Leavenworth, Kansas, before this case is over. And that doesn't, uh, I think it's kind of a small group, but we plan to spend a lot of time in Kansas with Chelsea. We'll also have to spend time here, and we'll do whatever else we need to do. But I want to talk just for briefly about what this case means to Chelsea and what it means to the rest of us. In the first place, Chelsea was already punished enough. In fact, way, way too much for what, whatever she did. The months of solitary confinement were outrageous, they were unnecessary, they were completely punitive. Uh, no other country in the world uses solitary confinement exactly the way we do, certainly none of the European countries. It, it, it destroys the mind, it destroys the body, and there is no excuse for it in this case. This also leads to the denial of the speedy trial right. This is going to be a big issue on appeal, we already know. And there's a wholesale lack of due process that we're all aware of so far, and who knows what else we're going to find when we really get into the record. But what I want to talk about today is one thing we all know exists in this record and would be also a big part of this appeal, and that's the misuse of the Espionage Act. This case, Chelsea's case presents a dangerous precedent and one that needs to be overturned. If this case stands, along with some other recent cases, anyone who ever leaves a single page of classified information or even non-classified information runs a risk of prosecution under this act. The Espionage Act was meant to punish spies and saboteurs and people who steal things from the United States and take them to foreign countries to benefit that country or to specifically hurt the United States. It was never meant for whistleblowers. It should never be used in these kinds of cases. If there's a violation for misuse or mishandling of classified evidence, so be it. But the Espionage Act should not be used. And as Kevin mentioned, in addition to the fact that we've known each other for a long time. Um, the lack of criminal intent is, is frankly horrifying to me as a lawyer that Chelsea was convicted and is going to spend 35 years in jail without any burden whatsoever on the government to prove that she intended or had reason to believe that these disclosures would harm the United States or then for the foreign government. In her case, the government picked right up on a recent additional case, the case involving Mr. Kim, where the court had ruled this. This is frightening to a lawyer. It is frightening that the Espionage Act has essentially become a strict liability crime, that the only intent required is the intent to disclose. Uh, and we simply cannot let that continue. Additionally, we've seen over the past years, even going all the way back to the Pentagon Papers, but more recently, a huge increase in what the United States government calls national security information. This includes information that's classified, information that's not classified, 
although the government tends to classify everything remotely connected to what it determines as national security. And this then becomes another huge advantage for the government. The government, in fact, and I'm sure some of you know this, has even classified the thoughts, perceptions, and observations of some of the prisoners in Guantanamo. It's classified what's in people's brains because it can if it holds them and they can't speak. This kind of overclassification is wrong, it's illegal, it's a violation of the executive order that creates classified information because the government cannot classify information solely to prevent embarrassment to itself. That's right in the executive order. And yet that's exactly what it's doing. And it does it more and more. So by calling more and more national security evidence, by overclassifying it, the reach of the espionage act gets even greater. And the government has even a lower burden than it already has. We cannot let this continue. A healthy, free society needs those who are willing to take the risk that the public knows what it needs to know. Now, it's true that the government has a right and a responsibility to protect its sources and methods. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about far, far beyond that. And in addition, to lowering the government's burden and making it easier for it to prosecute these espionage cases, the government has also selectively prosecuted them. So only those who leak the information the government doesn't want out get prosecuted. And those who leak the information the government does want out don't get prosecuted. And those who are in the highest levels of government don't get prosecuted. So the people who get prosecuted are people like Chelsea, who have nowhere to go, who, for whom the Whistleblower Act, the Military Whistleblower Act, really doesn't apply. No one's going to listen to her, and no one did listen to her. And let me give you an example, uh, a very uh, tiny example. As most everyone knows now, there's a big fight being between the Senate Intelligence Committee and the CIA over the CIA's classified torture report. They reported its torture program, and it was torture, so we might as well call it what it is. The executive summary of that has now been sent to the President, and theoretically it's going to uh, get reviewed and classified. Although I have some bets out about how long that will take and what we'll ever see. But we have seen some media reports over the last few days with pieces of it that have been leaked. Now, I cannot and will not comment on what those pieces of it were. But I can say that I will bet anyone that there's not a single person being investigated, much less prosecuted, for those leaks. In fact, I bet that those are leaks that the agency wanted leaked out for some reason or another. And who knows? The point is that this selective prosecution is what harms us and harms Chelsea. And this use of a draconian act, the Espionage Act is a draconian act. It has hardly ever been used in the history of this country and it's been used more by this administration than it has altogether. It has to stop if we're to have any freedom of speech, if the First Amendment is to exist at all, and if the people will continue to have the right to know what the government is doing. We have to know what our government is doing. We cannot prosecute people who tell us what our government is doing and remain a free society. as lawyers is to go through this record with a fine-tooth comb to find everything we can
to work with Chelsea and her detailed counsel to write the very best brief we can for her once that appeal process begins. I hope that the lawyers bill there um, at Georgetown will consider inviting us back after that brief is written. Because at that time, we'll all have a lot more detail that we can talk about. I suspect part of it will be classified, but probably a very small part, and we'll work to make that uh, every part that we can accessible. Also, let me just say, if there's anyone out there who'd like to communicate with me, um, I'd love to hear any of your ideas. Lawyers or not, that's how we learn. We get ideas about things that may be something that we're missing, uh, that somebody who sat through the trial will remember. Please write to me, and I'll be happy to discuss anything that's not privileged, confidential, or classified. Other than that, I'd love to talk to anyone about it. Let me, let me just conclude by saying, on behalf of Chelsea, that we really thank all of you for your continuing support of this case. We have a very long way to go, and an uphill battle. This appeal will take a long time. We have a bunch of courts to get through. Um, we have two appellate courts. We have the Supreme Court of the United States. We have a possible habeas. We will stay with this case until there are no more courts and nowhere else to go on behalf of Chelsea. But you know, we've lost a lot of constitutional rights since I became a lawyer. I used to give a talk about the Fourth Amendment, and every time I gave that talk, there was a little less to talk about because more that had been chipped away. And I've given talks about the First Amendment and seen it be chipped away. There's one right that we still have, and that Chelsea has. And that's the right to be represented by a lawyer. And the right to have that lawyer is an essential right. Chelsea has the right to have a lawyer stand between her and the power, the awesome power of her own government, when that government is directing everything it has against her. That's our job. Vincent and I will stand between the government and Chelsea. And they'll have to get past us to get to her. That's the stand we'll take. Thank you all so much. Thank you. There's a virtual meeting with Nancy Hollander. As, as you can see, she has, she has a great lawyer, great advocate in Nancy, so we're lucky to have her. And um, it's going to be a long battle, but I think, I think Nancy really showed why this is a case of big importance, not just to Chelsea, but to the future of the country. And I hope that the people in the uh, establishment media recognize that they're futures on the line with this case as well and come to her side and recognize they should be starting to plan their amicus briefs in support of Chelsea Manning because uh, freedom of speech really is on the line, freedom of press is on the line uh, with this case. So, uh, And now there is also an, another lawyer working uh, on this case and that's Vincent Ward. Uh, Vincent, uh, as, as Nancy mentioned, has some experience in the military as well as civilian courts. Uh, he represents clients in both criminal, civil, and administrative cases involving national security, security clearance, and military issues. He's a former Navy JAG officer where he worked on national security cases. He's held high positions in the Obama administration as well as in the administration of Governor Bill Richardson uh, of New Mexico. Uh, and so please welcome Vincent Chase, uh, excuse me, Vincent Ward, so we can hear his comments. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, yes, you need this mic. Nancy's pretty cool, right? She's amazing. Um, I, uh, I'm, I'm Nancy's law partner. I, um, let's see, I met Nancy Hollander when she was representing Winho Lee. 
Um, and I was a law clerk at the time at the University of New Mexico School of Law. And I, I, uh, let's see, that was in the late 90s. And I could tell you that now there isn't any difference in the way that she approaches her life, her practice. She's passionate. She's hardworking. She sent me about 15 emails um, since this has been going on. She works tirelessly on her cases. And I think that um, uh, I know that it's a great honor for her to represent Chelsea. It's a great honor for me to work with Nancy and to represent Chelsea and pretty cool to be here. Um, I don't know what else I can say really after all of these wonderful speakers. Um, wh one thing I want to say is there is another member of our law firm, Mike Goldberg, who lives in Washington, D.C., the Washington, D.C. area, and he he's here today. <laughs> and, I, and I'm sure Mike will be a wonderful resource. You know, it's, it's funny, one of the people always look, uh, they, give, they have a puzzled look on their face when we say that we live in New Mexico. And um, how it is that lawyers from New Mexico work on cases like this. And I don't really have a good answer for you, to be honest, except that I think that the lawyers in, in the law firm like Nancy, um, who moved to New Mexico for, for various reasons and stayed there because they loved it, are really good. Um, and I think that the, the, the law firm has a, a great reputation because we care about doing cases that are important and I can't think of a case that's more important than Chelsea's case, frankly. Um, I think that when, when, um, when it's all said and done, history, uh, uh, Chelsea will be um, remembered uh, as a person uh, of great importance uh, for what she did. And I think that our hope is that an appellate court, and hopefully the first appellate court, agrees with us about that. And that this, this journey is actually a lot shorter um, than it may be. But I think that, that everybody knows that this may very well be a very long journey. And, you know, as Nancy alluded to, we don't have a lot to substantively say about the case right now because we haven't even really seen a record of trial. Um, what I do want to tell you, based on my experience of having been a JAG in the military and worked um, in, in fairly high levels as a young lawyer in various government administrations, is that we definitely recognize the tension um, for whistleblowers and truth tellers and the people that run the government. And I've certainly seen that firsthand. And I think that it's very courageous of our panelists and very courageous of Chelsea to do something that, frankly, not a lot of people do. Uh, a big part of my practice um, is, is a civil practice, and I represent whistleblowers, and I represent people that are critical of the government and, and have their First Amendment rights violated. And it happens across the spectrum, but how many people end up in jail for it? And not just in jail for a little bit of time, this sentence is a 35-year sentence. If, if Chelsea served her entire term, think about how old Chelsea will be when she's finally able to get out and practice law as a lawyer. Um, I think that no reasonable person would think that the sentence that um, was imposed was a reasonable one. And I think through my experience, um, the military system uh, has to answer for itself, frankly. I think that it's a system that not a lot of people know about, this court-martial system. It's a, it's a system that I was raised in, frankly. This is where I learned how to be a lawyer. And I, and I do think that, fortunately, um, the people that were my commanders cared about the due process rights of people and they cared about doing the proper thing. But I think that there are um, problems with the military system. And I think that not only is, is Chelsea's case an opportunity to think about things like the Espionage Act, and not only is it important to talk about these important whistleblower issues, but it goes to the core of the military system itself. And, you know, I'm a veteran and we have a veteran up here. We have a couple of other veterans up here. And what you, you often hear about with veterans is 
you know, support them by helping them get jobs and support our military by uh, making sure that they have the benefits that they need and make sure that our active duty members, you know, get paid and that they have equipment that works. You know what else I would say? Give them a legal system that works too. Give them a legal system that works. And I think that when we look at this case, and, and you all probably know better than I do, frankly, um, because of your longstanding involvement in the case, there are issues that are very apparent about whether the military system was just to Chelsea or not. And I think that it starts with the amount of time that Chelsea spent in jail awaiting a charge sheet. She spent not days, but months and months and months waiting for a charge sheet while the military uh, tried to figure out what to charge her with. And one of the first articles in the UCMJ is Article 10. And Article 10 goes to the root of having a speedy trial. And when you read the cases related to Article 10, what you see is that Article 10 gives rights that are greater than the Sixth Amendment when it comes to speedy trial. And I think that one of the issues that we will be focusing on and an issue that you should care about for Chelsea is whether her speedy tri uh, trial rights were violated. You know, another issue that you um, hear about in Chelsea's case is this concept of um, unlawful command influence. Mm -hmm. And it goes, this is another one of the core issues in the military system and something that is very controversial is the level of control that a commander has over a case. Now, I served as a prosecutor in the military and you frequently hear about this notion of prosecutorial discretion in the civilian system. And what I could tell you is in the military system, there isn't prosecutorial discretion because that that responsibility belongs to the commander. And I think that one thing that you often hear in the military system when you're a baby JAG, a baby lawyer, when it comes to military justice issues, is that the role of military justice is to promote good order and discipline. And so one of the tensions, I believe, in the military system is this notion that the Uniform Code of Military Justice exists for the purpose of maintaining good order and discipline, which by definition sounds as though it's contrary to due process rights. Now, do we really believe that a 35-year sentence is necessary to maintain good order and discipline in the military? I, I don't think so. I don't think that that's the case. And so I think that one of the issues that Chelsea, because of her courage, is bringing to the forefront is this whole concept of unlawful command influence. And, and as I understand it, there are numerous facts that existed about the, 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 the way the government went about deciding what they were going to charge Chelsea with, um, the, the, the crimes that she would face, and whether the commanders that were in charge of that decision exercise that discretion responsibly or, or whether it was predetermined. And I think that this is another issue with the military system is it, I do, I also happen to do what, what some people consider to be sort of personnel type issues, people that have been terminated from their jobs. And I think it's another issue with the military is there's this, there, there's this mixture of procedure that, that relates to criminal law and treating somebody like they're getting fired from a job. Well, Chelsea didn't get fired from a job. She was sent to prison for 35 years. And, and I think that when you, when you look at the various protections in the military system, I think that through Article 10, through Article 13, that there are mechanisms, if, if, a, if a judge, if a military judge will uphold them to protect Chelsea. And I think that our job will be to, 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 to make a persuasive case for why it is that in this case, the judge, um, the judge unfortunately uh, uh, had a different interpretation of those, those rules. Um, 
There also are a number, of, a number of other issues that I suspect will be briefed. There are issues related to discovery and, and the discovery that was given to Chelsea. There are issues um, related to how the, um, how the charges um, were split up and changed on the, on the eve of trial. And, and so there are a whole host of issues that go not only to the core of sort of the, the bigger picture of the case, but whether service members in general will have the opportunity for a fair trial. Can they expect when they put on the uniform and they're accused of doing something wrong that the system will protect them? So procedurally, let me just give you a little glimpse of where the case is at. Um, technically, the case isn't even uh, on our desk yet in the sense that the convening authority is still going through the process of acting on um, the, the record of trial, the decision of the court. Now this is, again, you know, I don't know how much familiarity you all have, but there, there are differences between the military system and the civilian system, obviously. They're, they're very different procedurally. And one of the differences is that in the military system, uh, the commanding officer, the convening authority, has the opportunity to overturn or change the sentence. And until the convening authority acts, the case actually isn't sent for appellate review. So I can tell you that Mr. Coombs is in the process of helping Chelsea uh, go through that. And at some point, I don't think that there's um, a deadline for the convening authority to act. Uh, I think they have a responsibility to act quickly um, then we'll know. And, you know, in a, in a perfect world for Chelsea, the convening authority would uh, reverse the decision, uh, much like they did for that high-ranking general, I believe, who was accused of sexual assault. Um, but in any event, uh, so that's what we're waiting on. Once that happens, there's, there's a, a, a built-in deadline that, uh, that frequently gets moved of, I think it's about 60 days to file a brief. I, I can tell you that given the size of the record of trial and the complexity of the issues that a brief will not be filed in 60 days. We, we have um, appellate defense counsel will be assigned to us to assist. I have um, all the belief in the world that they will be a great resource to help us through that process. But, but ultimately, what I just want to reiterate is that, you know, or, you, usually I go into my office and I shut the door and sometimes I put my earphones on and I just start reading the record and I forget about all the faces of people that support our clients. And so it's amazing to come here because it's very inspiring to see all of you. And I know that you provide your support in numerous ways, whether it's through um, your financial support, your emotional support to Chelsea, you know, I would just encourage you to continue doing that because I represent a lot of clients that are in a tough spot. And I think one of my jobs as a lawyer is not only to represent them legally, but to help them through those issues that they're facing. And I think in my experience, the clients that do the best with that are the ones that see and feel the, re the, the support um, that they're given, whether it's through family or other people. And I think in this case, you all know that you're like Chelsea's family. Um, she really needs you. I've had the uh, opportunity to meet Chelsea uh, one time at Leavenworth. I definitely don't think I would go to Leavenworth if Chelsea wasn't there. Um, it's in the middle, it, it, it's, it's in the middle of nowhere. Um, there isn't a lot around it. And you know, it's funny when you walk in and you start, I start interacting with the, uh, with the guards, um, the active duty people that are there because that's how you get a pretty good sense of what they think about your client. And it's pretty obvious to me that, that Chelsea has figured out her way around that place. She knows where to go, what to do, what to get to, to stay engaged and actively involved. That's definitely, you know, Emma, um, and the support group are definitely helpful in that regard, but Chelsea's sending me stuff before anybody else sends me stuff because that's just how she is. And I fully expect throughout this process, Chelsea will probably be the greatest resource for her own defense. And um, 
I just, you know, again, it's a privilege to be here. I'm happy to answer any questions you have about the military system, but mostly I'm just thankful that you're all here to support her.